Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar hosted by Rails to Trails Conservancy's Trail Expert Network. My name is Eli Griffin. I'm the Manager of Trail Development Resources here at RTC, and I'll be facilitating today's webinar. Our topic is creating equitable connectivity. Our presenter today is my colleague Shane Farthing, RTC's Senior Director of Active Transportation Programs and Head of our Research into Practice team. Shane has years of experience working on equitable transportation and most recently has led the development and implementation of Bikeable, RTC's customizable tool for analyzing community connectivity and evaluating how improvements to the bicycle network can help residents reach key destinations safely by bike. In this webinar, Shane will discuss Bikeable in the context of equitable connectivity, as well as more generally discuss how multimodal connectivity is assessed and explore how such assessment can inform transportation planning, land use, and development approaches and equity goals. Shane will also stick around at the end of his presentation to answer any questions you may have. And in case we don't have time to answer yours or if questions come up down the road, you'll find contact information for Shane and myself at the conclusion of this webinar. But before I turn the mic over to Shane, I need to run quickly through some basic housekeeping. First, as you probably already noticed, attendees will not be able to speak during today's webinar. All attendees are automatically muted as they join to keep background noise to a minimum. If you have any technical problems during the webinar, you may enter your issue in the question box, which can be expanded on the right-hand side of your screen. I will respond if I'm able, but your best course of action is to contact GoToWebinar's free customer support directly or view a selection of help topics at the links shown on the screen. And I encourage you to copy those links down now before we move on from this slide. As I mentioned earlier, we built in some time for Q&A at the end of Shane's presentation. If you have any questions about bikeable or equitable connectivity, please type them in that same question box at any time. And if for whatever reason you lose the webinar connection, please re-click your login link. You will be able to rejoin the ongoing session. Finally, after today's webinar, you will receive a follow-up email containing a survey asking you to rate our performance on today's webinar, more information about RTC's Trail Expert Network with a link to sign up for occasional email notices from us, and perhaps most importantly, a recording of today's webinar. So with that, Shane, I'll turn it over to you for our feature presentation. Thanks so much, Eli. It's really great to be here to talk about Bikeable and about some of our uh, multimodal connectivity tools today. This is something that we at RTC work on with communities across the nation all the time, but there have been some developments recently that made us think that it would be a good idea to come out and, and really talk through some of these new pieces of new resources that uh, really have only come out in February and March, so we're brand new. The first one of those is new guidance from the Federal Highway Administration on measuring multimodal connectivity. And what this guidance gives is really multiple examples of ways to measure multimodal networks, including network completeness, network density, route directness, access to des destinations, and network quality. And we're gonna look at a case study that uses our bikeable tool to incorporate elements of all of these within an overall access to destinations framework. So you're gonna get to see how a few of these measures can work together uh, to specifically assess connectivity for bicycling. Uh, in this case, in, in the city of Milwaukee, it would be the case study, but it works nationwide. The other resource that's recently come out is from the Greenlining Institute. Uh, the Greenlining Institute is an organization out of California that's focused on opportunity and equity for people of color. And they've recently released a mobility equity framework on how to make transportation work for people. And we're particularly gonna borrow from their equity lens and their setting of a goal that the transportation network should be designed to provide connectivity to places of employment, education, services, and recreation to enhance economic opportunity for, for all people, but specifically for people of color. So at the end, you'll, you'll have links to both of these resources. They're both very, very good, and I encourage you to read them. But you can think of this presentation as essentially a mashup of these two concepts, showing how these FHWA accepted multimodal connectivity transportation metrics and approaches can and should integrate both land use and equity components to give all of us a clearer picture of a community's true level of multimodal connectivity. So today we're gonna to talk generally about equitable connectivity and its three components, the transportation network, land use patterns, and the equity lens. 
And we're going to show a real life application of this focusing on low stress bicycling connectivity in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And we'll break it down to show how each one of these three components of equitable connectivity can be addressed in a single composite analysis of a future trail network scenario. But I don't want to get too technical and bury the lead here. So let's just go to the big question that underlies all of this work and, and why transportation planners work on these things and why federal highways gave us guidance on it and why we're all thinking about this in the first place. And that is, can people get where they want and need to go? Everything we're talking about, everything that Federal Highway Administration spent 75 pages working on, is really answering that question. Can people get where they want to go and where they need to go without a car, without a giant hassle, without a stressful, unsafe trip? Are the regular people who aren't your strong and fearless bicyclists or, or aren't willing to uh, deal with negativity in, in their multimodal commute going to still make those trips, or are they going to forego those trips? This is a transportation and a land use question. But also embedded in this, we need to be explicit that there is an equity element. In every community, different neighborhoods, different groups, different people are going to have different experiences and different levels of connectivity to opportunity. So we need to realize that in addition to the transportation and land use piece, implicit in this key question is also an equity component. And we want to see how we can put all of these together and add this values-based component to what is otherwise a uh, mapping and community uh, assessment exercise so that we can really see if our transportation improvements are getting people to the things that they need to approach. So how do communities answer this complex question? It's really these three interrelated components. And for some reason, my slides are auto advancing on me, so I will try to fix that, but I'll also try to uh, adjust my speed at the same time. Um, but we're looking at the transportation element, the land use, and the equity element. Now, the transportation element is simply, can people move? Are the roads, the trails, the sidewalks, the bike lanes sufficient in quantity, quantity and quality that people can get where they need to go? It's about the roads themselves. The land use element is really the question of, is there a there there? Are the common trip origins and destinations close enough together in proximity that a person could walk or could bike in a reasonable distance? Or have we built our city, our community in a way that multimodalism is not really an option? There are development patterns that essentially can mandate using a, a motor vehicle and that's a function of density. It's often a function of zoning, separating uses. And in some places, we're going to find that there are economic deserts or disinvestment where there aren't enough origins for the trips to be possible for people that live there. The opposite of that, of course, is the place where placemaking and economic development have encouraged mixed use uh, scenarios with lots of destinations, lots of origins in close proximity. So the land use component is just important to whether functional trips can occur as the transportation uh, element. And finally, the equity element, who gets to go where? Who? Are all communities and all people in those communities similarly able to access destinations of need or opportunity? And are certain demographic factors correlated with inaccessibility over time in a way that community disadvantage is perpetuated? All of these questions are related. They can't be tackled one at a time. They need to be taken in combination because each affects the others, mutually changing developing communities over time. Our settlement patterns, our land development patterns, our travel patterns co-create the spatial fabric of our communities. So we need a tool that lets us look at all of these things together in all of their messiness and complexity. So that's really what Bikeable is. Bikeable is RTC's uh, research developed tool that lets us compare all of these things and assess all of these things in combination. And unfortunately, for this, this, uh, at this point, it's only available for biking and not for walking because we've not yet figured out how to constrain some of the messiness of uh, walking behavior. But we do have it for biking, and the whole tool is built around a GIS-based routing from origins to destinations and the ability to aggregate that across all origins and destinations in a community. Looking at this diagram, you can think of it as mapping how every residence listed in the phone book over on the left 
could access every business left it, uh, listed in the phone book on the right. So let's look at how those three elements, the transportation, the land use, and equity, get stacked together in Bikeable and what it tells us. So the transportation co component is really about network quality. It's an assessment of how good each element of the route is from every origin to every destination. So when we go into a city, every road, every trail, every intersection is scored. And it's scored based on the level of traffic stress that a bicyclist would feel. You can see on this continuum, larger roads with faster cars equal more stress. Slower and smaller roads and bike infrastructure that give people separate space are less stressful. And non-motorized trails, because they don't allow motor vehicles at all, have the lowest level of traffic stress possible. Now, this traffic stress concept is several decades old and has been applied in Europe for quite a while. Uh, but it's recently gained more attention and use among researchers and planners in the U.S. And the embrace of this concept in the new Federal Highway Administration guidance is really great to see as it's going to, to help planners make this the norm in American transportation planning. The embrace of this really is, is critically important and a number of the tools that are included in this new guidance include ways of using this level of traffic stress differently. To return to our diagram, now we can see that our roadway network in the middle, we've assigned levels of traffic stress to every segment and every intersection based on its quality. So now we can use this model to tell which residences are connected by low stress routes to which destinations, and conversely, which are disconnected and therefore not reachable except by intolerably stressful biking routes. And just to be clear, the tool does allow for some detouring, but it recognizes that there's a limit to how far reasonable people will detour around bad options before they give up on the trip. And it allows for st some stress, knowing that people might be okay crossing a short bad stretch, but they won't do it too often and they won't do it for extended periods. And these thresholds are set based on a line of research that started with the Mineta Institute back in the 1980s and continues today, thinking about the difference between the behavior of the strong and fearless cyclist versus the interested, concerned cyclist and the average person. And we hope that we'll be able to continue to improve this model and our understanding of stress levels and, and thresholds as we start getting new data from new technologies like our bike list, uh, dockless bike share partners that all have GPS. But for now, we, we proxy traffic stress through an analysis of widths, speeds, geographies, and infrastructure. And here's what that looks like when you apply it in real life. So this is Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and we're going to be using Milwaukee for this case study as Milwaukee has a strong plan to improve its biking network with a series of trails, cycle tracks, and bike lanes. You can see here that every road and every intersection has been assigned a stress level. And we can see obvious patterns. Lots of small residential looking roads creating blocks of green in a classic grid pattern in much of the city. But those green grids are bound by faster orange roads that are moderate stress, which people would tolerate for a bit, but would probably prefer not to ride on. And outside those, we have these red roads that almost nobody would feel safe riding on. Given their stress levels, those are not usable by risk-averse bicyclists, and they actually function more as barriers than as routes. And I think this is something that you can, you can see uh, if you have a, a, a sort of general sense of your own city, you probably have a feeling that there are residential roads that everybody can bike on relatively comfortably without too much intervention, but then you hit the arterial that you may not be as happy with. And then outside of that, you'll have interstates, you'll have you know, multi-lane roads that are much faster that really you, you wouldn't direct people to. And that's, that's really what we see in Milwaukee. It's a, it's a good average example here. So keep this picture in mind, as this is how Bikeable models the transportation component of a city. And we'll come back to this. But the second component of our equitable multimodal connectivity analysis is the land use component. And to go back to our diagram, the land use component is all about our origins and our destinations. As we said before, these origins and destinations aren't going to be neatly and evenly spread. They're going to be influenced by all sorts of geographic, historic, and political factors. And we're going to have some communities that are relatively well served, some that are relatively underserved. In some cities, we're going to have mixed use areas with so many origins and destinations on top of each other that the network quality almost won't matter. 
And at the other end of the spectrum, we're going to find some places that are so underserved by destinations that even with a great bike network, even with lots of trails and lots of cycle tracks, trips are just going to be too long for people to want to bike. And I highlight this again to remind everyone that while many of us come at this from a transportation standpoint, the origins and the destinations are just as critical to whether people can make functional trips as the network that connects them. So here we have, again, a screenshot of Milwaukee. And what we're showing here is the mixture of origins and destinations. And I'll give everyone a second to take a look at the patterns there. Uh, this is actually really, really detailed information, and we're zoomed way out. But every piece of pink that you see there is a residential parcel. So for our purposes using bike bowl, each one of those is an origin. Each one is a residence. And we try to weight the residents by the number of people at each location. That way, as we're routing things, we can know that more people come from, say, a multifamily apartment building than from a single family home. Because what we're really doing here is modeling the flow along low stress routes from these origins to the destinations. And to model flow, we really want to know how many people, not just what the geographic connection between the two places are. So pink is those residences, and every dark dot of purple is a key destination. And key destinations include all of the sorts of things that a person might want to bike to. Here we have the, the, full, the full kitchen cabinet thrown in there. It's everything from bars and restaurants, schools, parks, libraries, grocery stores. There are actually hundreds of categories of NAICS codes that we use in a consistent manner so that we have a standard methodology for addressing land use from city to city. And the idea is that we're looking at a broadly inclusive set of possible destinations along with all potential residential origins so that we're looking citywide and really seeing what the overall level of connectivity is. So now you've seen these two graphics, one of them modeling the transportation network and showing the level of stress for each component of that. And you see our pink origins and our purple destinations on the right. So now let's try to route all those people from all of those origins to those destinations and see what percentage can make it on low stress bicycling routes. And here we have a diagram that shows us in a graduated scale just who can uh, access the majority of those destinations. Citywide, 59% of Milwaukee residences are connected to a majority of the destinations. But you can see there's a wide range of connectivity levels. The blue area near the middle of the map shows very high connectivity, even despite having a bunch of interstates, because there are alternative routes and because there's just an awful lot of destinations there. There's a lot of destination density in that area combined with a grid that even in the face of those interstates gives people safe ways to bike around. Now for comparison, in the upper part of the map, that northern part of the city is very poorly connected, most under 20%. And we can see that that part of town is both lacking in destinations and is outside the grid development pattern that tends to provide low stress alternatives to the larger arterials. So this already tells us an awful lot about bike connectivity in Milwaukee, about the places where functional biking is easy, where it's hard, and what sorts of improvements could be made. So as we look at this, this is the kind of thing that city planners will often ask us to come and do to assess for their community the existing conditions so that they can think through their bike planning and their transportation network planning uh, so that they can decide how to take those marginal areas and make them better and how to take the truly underserved areas and undertake some potentially transformative projects because there's a lot of work to do in those. And to again look at this through the equity lens, what we're seeing here is areas in red where people are disconnected from a vast majority of opportunities, whether that's grocery stores to get food, whether that's uh, employment options. It's a high level of disconnectivity to all sorts of destinations that has ramifications on the level of opportunity throughout people's lives. 
And seeing the disparities at this level, and this is not unique to Milwaukee, this is not to pick on them, this is something that is, is relatively true across many cities, um, seeing the extent of the disparity made us want to use this tool to look more squarely at issues of equity and connectivity and to see how and whether and when those transportation inequities might correlate with other more traditional equity factors in American cities so that we could really get a sense of what is the right thing to do to promote equity in our transportation network so that we're not continuing to underserve the same people who are disconnected from opportunity historically, culturally, socially. So to add the equity component, we wanted to figure out how to use this tool differently. And what we did is we decided that we would, going back to our diagram here, we would limit the origins and limit the destinations in a way that let us hone in on a specific question. So in this simplified graphic, we've highlighted five residences in the lower left part of the image. And there's any, any number of reasons that we could want to look at a few specific residences. Maybe we're doing a neighborhood planning exercise for that area, and we wanna see specifically how changes will affect people within that geography. Maybe it's a high income area, and we wanna make sure that those potential spenders are well connected to our local business corridor. But maybe also it's an area that's experiencing disinvestment, and we specifically want to know if people there are able to reach the places they need to fulfill their needs and wants. And that's what we're gonna show you the example of, is, is that, uh, disinvestment version. But we're also going to, in this case, limit the destinations. In the previous example I showed, we had a large pool of destinations that was pretty much covering the entire city because we wanted to look at overall connectivity and get a general assessment. Here we decided to fo focus on a specific question. So on this graphic, we're looking at a low income area connectivity to the places that provide healthy foods. And we've done food desert uh, analyses in a couple of different cities and Bikeable works very well for that. And this is just a representation of how we would do it. Now, I could show you a food desert analysis for Milwaukee, but, but since we're Rails to Trails Conservancy and you came here to uh, learn more about trail networks, I went with a different example where we're gonna analyze a community of concern, low stress biking, biking connectivity to trails themselves. Like many American cities, Milwaukee has a significant population that doesn't get the minimum recommended daily exercise allowance to, to be healthy. And we know that when people have access to trails, they tend to get more exercise, come closer to those, those recommendations. So we wanted to look at whether a traditionally underserved population in Milwaukee had good low stress access to their trails and whether two newly proposed bike facilities would improve the situation for them. So to answer this, we needed to define our community of concern and make the residences within that community our set of origins. And then we need to identify the available trail access points in the city and make those our destinations and see what happens in between. So let's start with defining our community of concern. Now we did this with a stakeholder group from Milwaukee who helped us to discern what would be the right characteristics to help draw this community of concern. And in consultation with that group, it was decided that uh, percentages of poverty, Hispanic population, African-American population, and because we're talking about biking, zero car households, were the key data points that we had good census data available that would help us to define an area of critical concern for this sort of multimodal access to healthy infrastructure in the form of trails. So we pulled all of these, created the heat maps, and then we created a composite area that took all of those into account and decided that this was the area of most critical need um, for this analysis and for accessibility. So this shape essentially becomes the outline of all of our origins. The gray line there shows the entire city of Milwaukee. The red line shows this, this data-driven composite uh, of the key community of concern. 
So what we're doing, what we're doing is we're essentially taking every household limited to those within that area. And then we're going to try to connect those to all of the trail access points that are available in the city. And what you see here in the green is existing trails with all of the access points marked. Those are going to be our initial destinations. The red and the blue are proposed new projects. So what we're going to do is run the analysis twice. First, from the residences in our community of concern to the currently available trail access points. Then a second time from the same set of residences to all of the trail access points that will be available once these new projects are complete. And here you have the results. What you see on top is essentially the existing conditions. And we're showing that only 8% of residences within the neighborhood experiencing inequality can access a trail via low stress bicycle, bicycle routes. However, then you look at the bottom and you see that once these two new infrastructure pieces, the 30th Street Corridor and the KK River Trail are created, a full 66% of residences within that same neighborhood of inequality can access a trail via low stress biking. So we can see that completing these two projects will massively increase the connectivity of the members of our community of concern to trails. And we can extrapolate and estimate using other tools that likely usage and health effects of connecting those residents will make the case for doing these projects. So that's why as advocates for healthy communities and trails at RTC, this sort of equity focused multimodal connectivity analysis is important to us. It, it lets us show that there are real world effects to getting people access to the type of infrastructure that will make them healthier and that will stitch communities together. We have embedded in this an equity argument, a land use argument, a transportation argument, a health argument, and all of the other benefits that we know of trails. And this helps us to quantify that so that we can go to cities and say, these pieces of infrastructure really matter. And this was built by combining those three components, transportation, land use, and equity into a single analysis aggregated at the citywide scale from all residences to all destinations, and then honed in on through an equity lens to find this particular questions that we can best answer through infrastructure improvements. And what we end up with is a full scale assessment of citywide multimodal equity. So to recap, equitable multimodal connectivity is all about ensuring that people can get where they need to go safely and comfortably, regardless of mode. The Federal Highway Administration has released guidance on multimodal connectivity that gives us dozens of options on methodologies, uh, looking at walking and biking stress, looking at densities, looking at connectivities. I really encourage everyone to take a look through that guidance and find the pieces that speak to your community's particular needs. There are a lot of different tools, but there aren't that many methodologies there, and all of them provide us a different lens of looking at how people who choose to bike or walk uh, are enabled in comparison to those who choose to drive. And that's important for all of us. The Green Lining Institute has released its mobility equity framework that states that an origin destination approach to destinations of opportunity is a key goal, specifically for people of color in California. But that's a lesson that I think we can all learn across the country that in every city where we see these equity disparities and where we see these connectivity equity disparities, there's always a follow-up question that you can ask. When you see that connectivity heat map going from red to blue, you have to ask that follow-up question of what can we do not just to make things uh, better connected across the board at the citywide scale, but how do we make sure that those who are disconnected from opportunity have better connections and that we don't just continue to perpetuate uh, some of the biases that may already be built into the pre-existing land use settlement and, and infrastructure patterns. A 
full assessment of multimodal connectivity requires one to analyze not just the transportation features, but also the land use features, and to answer that, that follow-up equity question. And what you've seen here today is how RTC's bikeable tool is designed to conduct this type of equity connectivity analysis for bicycling and to prioritize and rank and understand the effects of future changes to any of those features. So for our purposes, we often are looking at this to justify investments in the bikeable transportation network, looking for new trail corridors or new uh, cycle tracks or bike lanes or improvements of that sort. But just as easily, this tool can be used to understand the effects of new land use decision making, whether that's zoning, whether that's locating a business and deciding where you might have more bike accessible customers, uh, or through the equity lens, where you want to look at particular differentials across communities and how a new uh, land use decision, whether that's a new set of residences or a new set of businesses or a transportation decision will relatively affect uh, two different communities. So I promised at the beginning that I would make sure you had a link to the resources that I'm referring to. Uh, here you have a link to the official Federal Highway Guidance page. Uh, it was down a little bit over the weekend, but it seems to be up now. And you can access the report either online or download it as a PDF. Um, the Mobility Equity Framework from the Greenlining Institute is the second link there. And then the third link is uh, an explanation of Rails to Trails bikeable tool. And it has full information on how it works there, as well as my contact information. And I will put in the quick plug that we really love looking at different cities of all sizes and shapes and applying Bikeable uh, in a whole host of different flexible ways to help communities uh, plan their connectivity landscape better. So uh, I'm happy to answer any questions, but I also hope that if, if you think your community might be able to benefit from this, uh, please shoot me an email or give me a call. Um, I, I really have a lot of fun uh, using this tool. And with that, I'll turn things back over to Eli. All right. Thank you very much, Shane, for that uh, presentation. And I'm glad you ended on the uh, plug for Bikeable because I'll uh, uh, tee us off with some um, questions I know you field quite often while I uh, sort through the questions we received during the presentation. So um, one question I'll pose to you is why is RTC, who many people will think of us as the traditional trails organization, a large trails nonprofit who focuses historically on rail trails. Why are we leading in this space, which is most often looking at on-road bike connectivity? Yeah, I think, I think we've realized that for our traditional trails to really be maximally beneficial to communities, we need them to be networked and accessible, and we need people to be able to get to them. And we don't necessarily want to require folks to throw their bikes in the car and, and go out in that sort of way. So we want to we wanna make sure that we are uh, ensuring that people can actually safely get to the trails and that the trails come, become part of a functional transportation network. Um, we're probably never going to have a situation, especially in, in urban areas, where you're going to have a trail go right to your front door. Um, so being able to get to the trail as well as to those key destinations is, is really crucial to making a network in which people can choose to go by bike or on foot for their, their daily destination. So I, I see what we do in the on-road piece as really a, uh, creating a feeder network for the larger trail network projects that are the more traditional uh, RTC wheelhouse. Great. Thank you. And one more question I know you field quite often is, this Milwaukee example, which you pointed out, is an example. This can be applied elsewhere. Milwaukee is a medium-sized city. So are there any city size limitations or requirements to be able to do this kind of bikeable analysis? Well, it's, it's an interesting question because the tool works at any scale. Um, but it may, in some cases, tell you that biking is particularly hard at certain scales. Um, essentially, the research tells us that people are willing to bike outside of your hardcore cyclists. Your, your regular folks that you might induce to bicycling are willing to go two and a half to three miles in a, in a trip from origin to destination. So if your community is 
large enough and the density is low enough that you don't have a mixture of residences and businesses within that two and a half to three mile proximity, you're probably going to find a lot of disconnectivity regardless of what your uh, transportation network is like. So it's not necessarily that the tool doesn't work, but that one of the one of the research based parameters is that people who are going to bike for transportation aren't going to do it for an infinite distance. So I wouldn't say it's a size requirement, but there is certainly a density uh, expectation and threshold. That said, though, we've done this on some very large and very small places, and the results are still informative, and, and I think they've still been helpful for showing which are the nodes that are particularly uh, multimodal accessible versus which are not, uh, because some communities have explicit goals of, say, uh, TOD or other density uh, building components where they want to replicate certain parts that are walkable or bikeable uh, in parts that may not be right now. Excellent. Thank you. So now let's dive into these questions we've received and feel free as we're talking to type in some more questions. We have a good bit of time here, I think about 25 minutes to uh, field these questions. So um, one I'm looking at here is from Richard Cania. And he asks if there was ever concern raised, presumably in Milwaukee, um, by officials or the general public that if you build the path, then it will not be used. So presumably they understand the value of this kind of investment, but worry that it might not be actually be used by the public if it were to be built. And how did you address those concerns? That's a great question. And it's one of the things that we always try to be very upfront with people is that we're we're really looking at maps here. We're not looking at humans. And this is all potential connectivity based on people's locations and networks. There is the additional step of once you've, uh, once you've built the, the connections, how do you get folks to use it? And that's always a concern. And we do have some other predictive tools that we, we use to uh, determine based on uh, previous counts and previous data that RTC has uh, within our database of how much usage is likely to come from a given trail investment in a given community, given its size and how it's designed and is it paved or unpaved and, and a bunch of different factors that let us try to predict usage. Um, there is a little bit of the, if you build it, they will come assumption, um, but I don't think that's where we stop. We try to quantify that a little bit and tell folks um, which pieces of a network are likely to experience the most usage so they can rank order and do the most impactful project first. We try to give them some rough idea of how many people we'd be talking about as usage. And frankly, um, you know, there's a whole other side to usage that comes from programming and from intelligent activation and encouragement, not just from the infrastructure itself. So. Um, as a longtime bike advocate working for an organization that has a lot of experience doing this, we try to help people to uh, follow up the if you build it, they will come argument with a little bit of historical data on how many people will come when you build it really well and what other types of ancillary things you can do to encourage additional usage and, and overcome some of the barriers to usage in, in communities to, to drive that, that usage and ridership as, as high as we can. All right, um, and here's another question from Christine Vanderlin. Um, she asks, for bikeable, does the model consider truck routes or other roads uh, specifically designated for use by heavy vehicles? And she points out that some lower speed roads could be higher stress than others for that reason. That's not in the default model in bikeable, but just about every parameter in bikeable can be changed, and we have changed them in response to community feedback on um, a, a number of different topics, whether it's on street parking being an issue, whether it's truck routes, whether it's in Milwaukee and Racine snow, um, pavement condition. Um, we basically have the ability to change the route, each segment and each intersection stress scoring from the default based on any exogenous factors that, that we find in the real world. And a lot of times when we do this, we'll be working with a steering committee of local residents who have their set list of top concerns in, in that community that will put a thumb on the scale to make sure that we've addressed those particular needs. Um, it was especially interesting to see some of the places that, that have a lot of snow and don't have a lot of snow clearing 
where um, perhaps a road actually loses a lane much of the year or loses the bike lane much of the year and therefore would have to be essentially run in a summer condition and a winter condition. And, um, you know, those things we kind of have to respond to on the fly and, and bikeable is very flexible and not really a one size fits all. Um, we just have to think rationally together and, and, you know, keep things as objective as we can while taking the input from the community on how things actually happen there that we may not be able to tell from uh, paper plans. Okay. And here's a big question for you. Um, you talked a lot about equity, um, but Ashoka Alvarez asks how the tool can be used to address displacement and gentrification in particular. Yeah, it's interesting. And I, I see that somebody else also asked about, about gentrification and um, it's a, it's a, it's always a sensitive issue. Um, many of the places that we have applied bikeable, the concern has been uh, more about disinvestment in the communities than it has been about gentrification. Uh, I certainly understand that in some cities, you know, we're located in, in DC and we know that New York and San Francisco, there's a lot of talk about how um, trails may correlate with gentrification. Um, in some of the cities that we've worked on on the opposite side, we have traditionally underserved areas where, especially after the housing crisis, folks are underwater in ways that gentrification is not their concern. They're looking for any form of amenity that might bring uh, reinvestment and, and bring back some investment in those areas. And you know, the truth is we can use this tool to assess what opportunities a uh, particular investment might help you to get to. We haven't, this doesn't help us with that correlation versus causation question of what do trails do to communities. And that's something that in our research team, we're looking to really put some more quantification behind because we do know of this concern that is often expressed in uh, quickly gentrifying areas that trails may have some role in exacerbating that. We also have positive experiences from other communities that have limited economic opportunity that trails provide a, a positive there. So we can hypothesize that, that trails probably have some positive but differential effect on land value and um, determining how that gets sorted out equitably is a big question that we're working on. Um, I can't say that Bikeable is exactly the tool that helps us sort that out, but it helps us to look at the communities that are most in need of connection to opportunities and find ways to do that. And it may help us to see the places that are already sufficiently connected and know that we should be investing in, in, in other places um, so that we do have equitable connectivity there. I hope that's a reasonable answer to the question to say that uh, it's, a, it's a major concern that we know bikeable and our understanding of trails are going to all fit into, uh, but there's a there's a economic analysis that needs to happen there outside of bikeable on how trails affect land value, and then if there's a positive showing of trails effect on land value, a separate assessment of how is increased land value equitably distributed within a community. Okay, and Ashoka's follow-up question to that, and, and you definitely touched on it a bit, was how is the community being engaged in order to ensure that the benefits are going to actually help those who are already there? And I think a helpful way to answer that, at least initially, is could you tell us whether community engagement itself is a part of our role in Bikeable? Yes, it is. And I should mention that we do this in a couple of different ways. Uh, RTC has some communities that we have long-standing deep engagements in where we're working to create uh, trail nation projects of, of major significance where we're trying to stitch together networks and much of our work in those communities is about community engagement about coalition building and we bring this tool to our coalition and essentially try to embed their values in all of the decision making as you saw from the equity piece especially there's an awful lot of uh, community focused decision making on what's important, what lens should we view this through, 
who are we trying to serve that we take directly from our focus groups. So the community of concern that we drew in Milwaukee was done in consultation with our uh, Route of the Badger partners on the concerns that they thought were most relevant to Milwaukee. So in those areas that we have that deep community engagement, we absolutely uh, take the lead from the community. Now, as a tool, we also want to get this out there as much as possible. So we'll also offer this as a contracted service to folks like planning departments or transportation departments or uh, council of governments, uh, MPOs, if, if they're looking just for the analytic assessment. And in that case, we run things a little bit more by the book and take the planning department's lead, but we still want to make sure that uh, we're running it in a way that respects the community's wishes. We just have to rely a little bit more so that since we don't have the deep relationships there on those professionals and planning departments and, and community leaders uh, to use the information responsibly and to conduct the engagement that ensures that we are running something that reflects the actual community needs. Great, thank you. And here's a very practical question from Tim Blagden who asks, if there's a set cost for Bikeable? There's not a single set cost, but I encourage you to uh, shoot me an email. Um, as I just mentioned, sometimes we are physically in a place doing a community engagement process over a period of years on this. Uh, sometimes we're uh, running data that cities already have that's in very, very good shape and basically fits right into our model. A lot of times we're in sort of a middle ground where we have to put a few weeks into assessing a city's data. You know, some places have uh, really, really good information about their speed limits, their lane widths, their uh, topography, geology, all the things that go in there. Uh, other cities have very little. Um, so the things that we can get remotely, uh, we can do cheaply. The things that we have to come and assess we have to charge for our time and, and for the effort of, uh, of, of doing that sort of data gathering and, and GIS analytics. Um, so I would say the, the, the range can go anywhere uh, from, you know, fairly cheap for a planning tool of like $5,000 uh, upward. And uh, if we're going to be in, engaged for many years, uh, significantly upward. But it's something that uh, we really like to do. So we're doing this as nonprofits who want to get the information out there. And we'll try to work with you as, as much as we can in any community to make sure that uh, if there's a need, uh, we, can, we can partner to meet it and uh, look for the, the resources to, to get it done. OK. And here's a um, more uh, technical question from Don Byrne. Um, it looks like he and his community is working to update its GIS street layer. Um, and wants to know if there's a document that specifies uh, the GIS data that Bikeable needs. Yes, and Don, if you email me, I will send that to you, or I don't know what we have to get it back out to folks. It's a, it's a pretty technical document, so I don't know if everybody will necessarily be interested in it, but certainly someone who's doing uh, GIS data gathering, um, there's a certain key set of attributes that we can, we can share with you. Um, and another, uh, question from Tim Blagden here. Um, he says he's gathered level of traffic stress information from many communities that will be served by a trail they're building. Can that existing data they've gathered be used for bikeable or do they need to recollect and re-enter the data? We would need to see how your level of traffic stress was estimated. Um, like I mentioned, the Federal Highway Administration guidance that just came out gave us several different ways that you can measure and compute uh, LTS. And Bikeable can accommodate several, but not all. So we would have to look at what the proxies are that were used to compute your LTS uh, numbers and make sure that it matches with the same proxies that we would need so that we can uh, be working apples to apples. All right, uh, Jonathan Fritzke um, asked if in the bikeable analyses RTC has done so far, have we looked at connections that include existing transit routes? We're actually doing one right now in Cleveland that looks at transit routes. And transit's interesting for us because 
uh, as you saw from the basket of destinations, we're normally looking at a very dispersed routing model where we're trying to say, how can you bike to all of these places? And transit's a little bit different because most people don't want to bike to all of the places. They just want to bike to the one nearest them, at which point they will get on the transit system and, and continue um, after that sort of first mile connection. Um, so we're, we're looking at it right now. It, it does work. As a as a modeled outcome, but we're still playing with exactly what the what the best way of doing that would be. When we started off trying it using our traditional model, where we put in all transit stops as destinations, it gave us a very pretty map, but it was sort of nonsense because it doesn't really reflect uh, normal person's behavior. Nobody would decide that they want to bike to the farthest away transit stop. So it actually the mapping gets a little bit simpler. And some of the main things that we're finding actually are, again, related to um, density around and how much uh, in the transit piece, how much transit-oriented development can, can help make connectivity around those nodes that has sort of a spiraling up usage effect. Um, but it's something that we're still playing with right now. And I want to say the answer is yes, it does give some interesting information, but requires running the tool in that sort of modified uh, tightened scope. Okay, and it looks like we might have uh, one more that you haven't touched on already. Um, and this was from early in your presentation, so I imagine it was specific to uh, the Milwaukee analysis. But Courtney Geary asks how you define the majority of destinations that you use uh, in your analysis. So in the primary analysis, we really do just dump a huge number of destinations in so we can get that citywide piece. And there are defined criteria for how many of each uh, destination type we want to get to. So we pull from hundreds of NAICS codes, and we essentially set a number along with the community of how many uh, of each folks want to be able to get to. And it's not in the hundreds or thousands. It's normally like people want to be able to get to you know, four banks or 10 restaurants, that kind of thing. So that's a scalable parameter that we have a standard uh, suggestion of what makes sense. But again, we, we take into account the community's desire. Um, you know, maybe if we were going to run this for a uh, advocacy group that uh, was interested in uh, downtown economic development, a lot of times they're super interested in retail, restaurant, and bar. Uh, and they'd want to get everybody to 10 of those. Um, if we were running it for a municipality or a different type of civic organization, they might be really interested in schools, libraries, and making sure that everybody can have uh, a multitude of choice of civic activities. Um, so we can dial up and down the, the numbers as we go. Um, really what we're aiming for is what's a reasonable amount of choice for an individual to be able to access of a particular category from their home. And it's something that when all of our reports, we detail very clearly how that's set. I apologize for not including those numbers in the Milwaukee analysis, but um, it, it, it's really sort of a, a reasonable choice based standard. All right, and it looks like we have one more question that just came in and it it's less about bikeable, I think, and more just general uh, trail and transit integration. Um, Don Byrne wants to know, if any work has been done around the country where a shuttle system transports bikes so that the first mile, last mile situation, presumably between bike infrastructure and the transit stop, um, is eliminated? Uh, I don't know of anything that's sort of a specific shuttle system, but I, I, I think that is addressed in a lot of cities by ensuring that the standard bus network uh, allows for bikes. I think there's a lot of uh, you know front end bus racks so that you only have to get to the outermost bus stop and then you take the bus to the main uh, transfer to rail if, if, if that's an option in your community. Um, you know, the, the first mile, last mile question right now is, is getting so interesting and complicated and changing as we talk about a whole changing, changing transportation landscape um, that it's a great question. There probably is space for something shuttle-like to accommodate some of that and to make bikes uh, more accessible out there, especially as we're starting to see, you know, things like dockless bike share 
the question comes up of do we even need to transport bikes or do we just have them at the origin and the destination and you can take one from either place. Um, so uh, I don't know of anything specific on a shuttle, but the entire uh, the entire transportation policy setting and the entire uh, sort of set of options that are available to us is changing so quickly, along with the data that we get from them, that uh, we're probably going to see a lot of things that none of us even thought of. Um, sitting in DC right now, I'm surrounded by, what, five companies of bike share and four of electric scooters, none of which were here a year ago. And all of those are, um, for many of us, first mile solutions to our rail system that we couldn't possibly have anticipated uh, being available to us. So um, it's evolving faster than, than I'm able to, to see forward, but I'm, I'm looking forward to keeping up. Okay, and I think that's a good spot to end. It looks like we actually will end on time, which is always nice. Um, you'll see our contact information on the screen in front of you now. Any unanswered questions um, about equitable connectivity and bikeable or any that you uh, come up with after this uh, webinar ends can be emailed directly to Shane. You'll see his email address right on the screen there. Um, and any questions about the Trail Expert Network and our webinar series can go to me. Uh, I want to thank everyone for their attendance and participation. I hope you found this presentation informative and useful as you consider or continue to work towards developing equitable connectivity in your community. Again, you'll be receiving a follow-up email shortly after this webinar with a link to the recording and a feedback survey. And we would really appreciate it if you would take the time to fill it out. It, it does help inform our future webinar topics. And with that, thanks again, everyone, for attending. And I hope you join us for another webinar in the near future. Have a great day.